All right, good morning and welcome to uh, this week's uh, edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Um, we broadcast the show every Wednesday, live every Wednesday morning, usually at 10 a.m. Central Time. Today we're doing it a little earlier due to some, well, we're having a statewide tornado drill at 11 a.m. Don't know what that's going to entail. We didn't want to have to worry about that for the show, so we bumped things back about a half an hour. <laughs> Normally the show is at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, both the live and um, we do record the show every week as we are doing today. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. Um, in your state, it may be the whatever state library state library um, so we provide services to all types of libraries across um, the state so we will have topics on our show that could be for all types of libraries uh, public academic k-12 um, schools um, corrections museums archives uh, anything and everything basically our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries something cool we think libraries are doing. We'll bring on guest speakers, talk about things they're doing in their libraries across Nebraska and across the country, um, the products and services that they might find useful. Um, we sometimes have library commission, Nebraska Library Commission staff come on and talk about um, programs and services we offer uh, through here, through our um, agency. And uh, that's, well, that's what we have today as Library Commission staff. I suppose we call this a, a program we offer <laughs> or a program we do <clears throat> here at the Library Commission. Um, we're going to be talking about our Friday Reads program. Um, this is something we've been doing for quite a few years, and we'll get into that in a bit. And um, we've done a couple of sessions over the years, sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> about Friday Reads program, talking about the books that we here at the Library Commission have read. Um, and we thought we'd do one here. It is almost one the one year anniversary, depending this week, last week, depending on when you in your area may have uh, started working from home, had your first lockdown, whatever, for the COVID-19 pandemic. So we thought we'd talk about what we had been doing, um, and what we'd been reading over um, the past year. And um, as you can see, there's five of us here today. We're all going to talk about some books we, we've, um, we um, have read over the year. And um, as each person goes, um, I'll let you guys introduce yourself when we come up to you. But what we're going to um, talk about first, um, Amy. Amy Owen is the one here at the Library Commission who kind of runs the program for us, corrals all of us, I think. <laughs> Yeah, um, so the Friday Reads series started uh, was started by Laura Johnson. She's our former um, continuing education coordinator, and she has since retired. But she started the series in 2014, so we are coming up on seven years this summer. Uh, and the concept was to model the idea of talking about books and to help readers to get our, to know our staff a little better. Uh, readers advisory and book talking are really valuable skills for librarians to develop, but they take practice. So this was a way for us to start conversations about books and to encourage others to share their own reviews. Um, and as I said, Laura started it and I took over when she retired. Um, I'm not even sure what year that was. So I started in this position in 2015. So somewhere in there. Um, we have enough readers on our staff that we really only need to write a review three or four times a year. So a couple mm -hmm. times a year I go through and I just make a list of, of when each person will write and then it's not too overwhelming since we only have those couple a year. And um, every once in a while we get a new staff person and I will just casually rope them in <laughs> try to get them to join in and that seems to work pretty well we have a few new ones so what right when they start they're, yeah. they're still yeah. enthusiastic about joining in <laughs> um so we post the review to our the encompass blog and then uh it also gets posted to social media facebook and instagram and um i went through and looked yesterday and we this week will be our 315th post wow um, and I, I divided out on that first link. I've just kind of corralled all of them into one page 
or you can go and, and search by tag in the in the blog. Um, but we've got 220 fiction uh, reviews and 94 nonfiction. So we'll see what we've got coming up this week if it's fiction or nonfiction. So, but that's that's pretty much the program. Yeah, and I'll see if I can show you over here if I did this right. There we go. Yeah, so here's the book reviews page. Um, where they're just all, I think, is this alphabetical by author, it looks like. Author alphabetical by author, so. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, split up fiction, nonfiction. So if you're interested in a particular topic or what I do, you know, do the year old control F or whatever for searching and look, yeah. for, a title, look, for, a, look for a particular reviewer if you want to know what someone is in particular is reading. <clears throat> and all of these would then link to that blog post. Yes. And oh, I, think it, I think it makes it easy to see if, if anyone has already done that book also. So you can just go down and, and find your author and. I do that. I've, I've I've had to check, especially now with so many years. Like, did somebody else ever already talk about? Because it's not all. This isn't like we don't have like a rule about it has to be a new book or something no. just coming out. Um, I've done things that are older that are from years ago just because I liked the, the title and wanted to share it and talk about sure. it. So yeah, it could be anything you'd find on there. Occasionally, it's not even one book. Someone will review a whole series. So we've had cookbook reviews. We have all genres. So. It's interesting to see what, what people do in their free time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see, get back to that screen. Cool. All right. All right. Yeah, and so and this is a program too. This is something we do here, but this is being done all over the country, all over the world, I assume. Maybe on um, lots of places you'll see we'll do Friday Reads. Um, there's also the um, Book Face Friday. We do that as well to promote different um, books and things, um, books, magazines, whatever people are reading. So um, we're not the originator of this, but we are participating in it. And I think there's been a few times when we've missed it, uh, people forget or... On occasion, so... Yeah. What's going on? We try not to skip, even if there's a holiday, we try not to skip it, but every mm -hmm. once in a while, one gets yeah. by us. So. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, but we've got, like I said, yeah, lots of people involved in doing it, so we have um, keep it going for as long as people want to keep reading and talking about it. Yeah. All right, so let's get into some of the titles we've been reading, and I put myself up first um, to get things started. This, over here. Um, this is one that I did remember when I blogged about it. It was last year though, in 2020. Um, Wonder Woman Tempest Tossed uh, by Laurie Hulse Anderson and illustrated by um, Layla Del Duca. And this is a graphic novel. And I, the two books that I chose to talk about today, turns out they're both graphic novels. Um, I think for this year, I was looking for things to read and to share about reading that are um, easier to get through than an actual book. Uh, that was my way of pandemic reading, I think as just things that went a lot quicker, not a lot of, uh, didn't need a lot of time and days and days of reading like a novel. Um, and both of the two that I'm talking about today, I did purchase and read last year. In so they were a part of um, you know, my pandemic. <laughs> and um, this is uh, one that I did actually in September, actually because it, well, it was before September, I'm looking for the date here, well, September 4th. Um, September last year was Library Card Sign Up Month um, from American Library Association. And the they always have an honorary chair and it's not always an actual person. And this year, it was, the last year it was Wonder Woman. So I'm like, hey, that's perfect. And I have this graphic novel, I'll talk about it. So I did a little push for sign up for a library card and then um, this book that I, this uh, graphic novel. This is a uh, reimagining of Wonder Woman's origin story. It is very similar to you, to what um, her um, classic origin story, but with some um, tweaks to it. Um, it's definitely been uh, modernized uh, this, to what's going on today in our world. Uh, um, Wonder Woman, Diana, Princess Diana from the Mascara is a refugee actually. And um, from there, uh, there are actually uh, refugees. She sees um, out in the ocean, there's a storm coming to her island and boatloads of refugees are getting are uh, caught in the storm. And she goes out to try to save them, gets caught in the storm as well, gets pulled out to sea and then becomes a refugee herself along with these people and goes through the same process they do at um, coming to somewhere new, trying to find, um, uh, 
um, someone, you know, what, what would they have to do to go through the process to the new country that they're coming to? So it's definitely a very timely book um, in this reimagining of it. She, um, it's the the country that they come from is not one that is um, a real country. They, they, it's kind of a just like the mascaras. It's a fictional country, so it doesn't speak of any particular refugees. But it is a war-torn country. Refugees are escaping from there. Um, she's 16 years old. This is, she's a teenager going through this, so she meets other teenagers who are going through the process. So it's good for teens from a children's point of view. Um, so it's very interesting to see how she views what's happening in the outside world, i.e. our world, regarding refugees. Um, there is a Steve Trevor, I'll say, in the book. The way that it is, he, he is portrayed is, I think, very unique, and I liked it a lot. I'm not going to give away any spoilers, um, but I highly recommend it for anyone who's just interested in likes Wonder Woman, likes graphic novels, and um, it's a little slightly more serious. All right, next up, this is you, Amy. Yes, um, this is Bob. Um, it's by Wendy Mass and Rebecca Stead. And this is a middle grade fantasy title. Um, I tend to read a lot of, of middle grade and YA fiction. Um, and I also tend to read a lot of really depressing nonfiction, but I, I don't want to review that as much for, for oh. Friday reads. I try to keep it a little more positive um, and not so long winded. But uh, this was a, this is an, a 2021 Golden Sower chapter book nominee. And I, I read it before when it was being considered for the nominations and I, I already knew I liked it. Um, but I have a fourth grade son who is a very reluctant reader. He likes dog man. He likes reading books about cars. He'll read picture books to his little sister, but you could not get him to sit down and just read a regular book. So he brought this home and he said, I heard this was really good. Yes, it is. <laughs> so I was very excited that he brought home something we could read together. Um, so, and afterwards, he said, "You know, I think this is one that we should we should buy. We should own this book." And that that's high praise. So, especially from such a reluctant reader. So, um, Bob is about an almost eleven year old girl named Libby that travels to Australia to visit her grandmother. And uh, she hasn't been there since she was five, so she doesn't remember a lot. Um, but she she has a feeling that she's that there's something that she should be remembering. And when she goes to uh, the room her grandmother has prepared for her, she finds it. In the closet, there is a small green creature wearing a chicken suit. Now this green creature has been waiting in the closet since the last time Livy was there, but she doesn't remember why. And the creature doesn't remember where he came from or, or you know, where he's supposed to be going. So um, the, his name is Bob and Livy and Bob uh, work together to try to recover her memories and to figure out where Bob came from and where Bob needs to go. So um, it's, it's really cute. Um, it's about, you know, going back to your childhood and, and uh, we, we both really enjoyed it, so. And it is it is now on our show. So. <laughs> we did buy a cup. So I know Sally has read this to you too. So. I thought it was wonderful. It was um, magical in that way, and and I don't want to give too much away, but you find out why it is that he can hide in this rather unusual chicken suit, and why she doesn't remember much about. The last time she saw him. Yeah. Mm. So I like that because I like to know why did this happen? Why did that happen? I like it when the author tells me. Mm -hmm. And for those of you, um, Sally here, Sally Snyder is um, our coordinator of children and young adult library services here at the Library Commission. So this is her, definitely her area <laughs> of expertise. All right. Else else? There we go. Uh, I think Susan. Yes, and I just want to tell Amy that I sympathize so much with her having a reluctant reader. I was the same way with Ian. I wanted him to be a reader so much, and I spent hours and hours reading aloud to him, which was he was perfectly okay with, but he mm -hmm. won't read himself. But he, he now scores really high whenever there's a, a like reading comprehension test, so I, I'm holding on to that as, as yeah. a benefit. 
Sometimes so, they come around later, yeah. yeah. Susan Heisley is our online services librarian here at the Library Commission. Um, so conventionally yours is a romance, and that really sort of fits into uh, my pandemic reading uh, uh, practice. Um, I've always had a real problem with the romance genre. I think I read some really bad romances when I was in high school. I read um, like Barbara Cartland, uh, and I read like some and I know good writers write for Harlequin, but I read some really bad Harlequin romances with a friend that were really cliched. You could predict what page certain plot uh, oh, so points so would for, Very formulaic. Yes, and formulaic. That's the word I was trying to think of. <laughs> and if you like that thing, like, you know, you just want something that's comforting, you know it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Sure. But that can get boring. Yeah and, predictable. yeah, and some of them are done better than others. Um, you know, I have so many stereotypes about romances based on the bad <laughs> reading experiences I had in high school. Um, you know, they're addictive, like something that's not good for you. Sometimes I feel emotionally manipulated because even though it doesn't really seem like very profound, I'm like tearing up at the point I'm supposed to tear up at, and it makes me mad. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I read some of those sort of bodice rippers that my mom had around when I was in high school and their horrible male-female relationship dynamics that makes that make me cringe. So I have all these negative stereotypes about romance. But um, that said, I, I, like Amy, I read a lot of depressing nonfiction <laughs> and the news is depressing. And this past year, I finally really had to admit that I needed a break. I needed a palate cleanser. <laughs> Um, and romance, uh, the romance genre really did sort of fit that role. Like I read several depressing uh, nonfiction books and then I feel like I have to read something different that I know is gonna <laughs> end happily. Um, that said, I try to find titles that don't fall into some of the traps that my high school romance reading fell into. And conventionally yours, I think, is a really good example of a uh, romance that doesn't feel like it falls into some of those stereotypes. Um, first of all, um, both protagonists are male, and so that immediately gets away from the like uh, icky male-female dynamics that some of the romances I read had. I didn't have to sort of worry about uh, you know, the damsel in distress kind of uh, trope. Uh, this is I is what I guess they call a new adult romance. So it's not YA, it's not young adult, it's not like high school students, but it's um, sort of, uh, it's people who are just becoming adults. They're not fully formed yet. They don't know what they're doing with their life. They're, um, in this case, both characters are sort of trying to transition from college to what comes next. Um, Conrad is 21, and he's actually been, uh, he had to drop out of college because his father cut him off financially when he found out he was gay. And so he's, you know, working a bunch of dead-end jobs trying to uh, pay for an apartment, pay for asthma medication, and figure out how he's going to get back into college. Alden is 23, and he is actually neurodiverse. Um, I don't think he ever got a specific diagnosis, but probably on the, you know, Asperger's uh, autism spectrum. Uh, really good student, good grades, but he didn't make, uh, he didn't get accepted to medical school, which was the intent, and so he's back doing some sort of post-bachelor's certificate program, and his parents are really pushing him to apply again to medical school, and um, they want him to write about his neurodiversity and his entrance exam because they think that will help him get in and he doesn't want to do that. And if he doesn't go to medical school, they want him to come up with another plan right away. So both of them are kind of in that precarious halfway uh, adult, halfway uh, not quite there yet. Um, they know each other because they both uh, play a, a 
card game Odyssey at the local game shop. And so they're in a gaming group together. So again, that's a little bit of a different setting for our romance uh, novel. Um, and they don't get along at the beginning. Um, Conrad views uh, Alden is really rules bound and um, anti sort of antisocial. Uh, he's a real stickler for doing everything by the book. Um, he's pretty rigid, not a lot of fun. Um, Alden, for his part, doesn't really know uh, Conrad's backstory, thinks he's just kind of a college dropout who's working dead end jobs, partying, you know, he's, he's a fairly charismatic person. So he views him as this, like, you know, everything's easy socially for him. So they constantly butt heads within the um, gaming group. And then uh, due to a variety of circumstances, they wind up, uh, taking a road trip together, just the two of them, there's supposed to be other people on the trip with them and it winds up just the two of them stuck in a car driving cross country in order to attend this Odyssey convention and play in a tournament um, competing for a uh, place on the Pro Odyssey Tour, which both of them view as sort of a solution to their near-term problems of what to do next. It's a way to have money, a way to have something to do. Um, so they're stuck together in the car. So again, it is a typical romance trope. It's, you know, enemies to lovers, forced proximity. Of course, on the road, they get to know each other better. They um, clear up their misperceptions about each other. They understand why the other is the way they are. They develop feelings, et cetera. You know, it's a romance. So I don't think I'm probably giving away anything when I tell you that, you know, things work out in the end. But again, it, it, it really sort of defied some of the stereotypes that I have about romance. And so it was a really nice uh, change of pace. And it's good, a happy ending, of course. Yes. <laughs> I was wondering about their uh, situation because I can tell from this book cover that it looks like, you know, being a geek myself, convention, some sort of nerdy convention, people dressed up cosplaying. Yeah. And I think that that would definitely catch a lot of people's attention or into well, that. Well, I think it's a series. So some of the other characters oh. from their gaming group are going to have their own stories. So. Oh, neat. Okay. I'll have to look for more of them. Yeah. yeah. All right. Ah, the usual suspect, Sally. I believe this is yours. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying, I'm the Children and Teen Library Services Coordinator here. So I read maybe eight adult books a year. And mostly I read picture books through books for teens and love them. So it's great. I keep a list of everything I read in an Excel file. That might be because I'm a librarian, but it comes in handy sometimes. <laughs> and so I know how many books I've read in that picture book to, to um, teen realm and how many adult books I've read, which are mm -hmm. few and far between. The adult books are great, but you know, I've gotten so used to reading teen books, which are written in a way to keep the teens reading, that when I get an adult book, I go, okay, the metal was green, let's go, let's move, what's going on next, come on. And they're lovely descriptions of beautiful places that I am not patient with because <laughs> I'm not used to it anymore. But that's, that's one of the things that happens with teen books is they're often written to keep things moving so teens don't put it down and leave it. Although there have been some very long teen books that have lots of they can be very, you know, good for adults too. I mean, the like I said, the, the, the two graphic novels I read, they are, you know, obviously you would think of them as comics for, and they are, um, I was just looking that up, the one, the Tempest Tossed, the Wonder Woman one is part of DC's graphic novels for young adults imprint. Oh, okay. But it's much more than that, I think, with the immigrant, the storyline, I would not have, like, if you hadn't told me that, I wouldn't have known from reading it. It it fits, it was, it's good for both, yeah, for adults and teens, I think. Good point. Well, The Usual Suspects is about um, particularly Thelonious Mitchell and his best friend, Nehemiah. They both enjoy pulling pranks at, 
their middle school, um, both to kind of get their teacher excited and to jab at the principal, but it's nothing ever dangerous. And now it's a gun in the park next to the school, right adjacent to the school. And Thelonious is really irked because once again, the first place they look for suspects in the school is the special education room. And they, they call it everything from, wait, let me look, special education to um, neurodiversity because there are neurodiverse students in there. Thelonious and, and his friend Nehemiah are both um, neurodiverse. And they, fe they feel like they're more warehoused than being helped. That's their perception of what's happening in school with them. And that comes through pretty well as they're trying to solve this mystery because they don't want the blame on their classroom again. If something gets broken, it's probably them. If something's been stolen, it was probably them. And that's just not fair. And the fact that they're both black young, you know, well, black boys kind of adds to that suspicion from the white people in the school's point of view too. And that's kind of in there, very um, low key, but in there too. And um, there is a, a, a Mr. Blockman, which is an interesting name. He is assigned to Thelonious. He is not a teacher. He is someone that works with Thelonious at the school to help him make better choices for himself and for what he's supposed to be doing in class. And he is a real, um, solid thing for Thelonious to work with because he's, he is on Thelonious's side, so to speak, but he does not uh, take any kind of guff from him either. So he's an interesting character in there with the, the teacher who you know, is willing to blame anybody kind of, and the principal is like, we've got to solve this now. So Thelonious and Nehemiah go to work to figure out how this happened. And they're not angels, no. They sell candy on the in on the school playground, and it's, you know that's not it's not bad candy. It's just you know something they're not supposed to do at school. So they do things like that, but they are not bad kids, and they don't want to be labeled that way either. So it's an interesting read. This is the the author's first book for middle grade readers, which is in my world because I'm older. That's upper elementary through the beginning of middle school age range, in my mind. I What do you think, Amy? Is that a good description of middle grade? Yeah, I tend to think fourth through sixth grade. So, and they're in, these characters are in seventh grade officially. For the, Has this the, author written for other grade levels previously? You said this is their first one for this particular? Um, the review said that he's written for adults. And oh. this was his first middle grade. And, and uh, one review said he, the, some of the language was a little um, advanced. I didn't notice that myself. Uh, I think that people give need to give readers more credit for what mm -hmm. they can can know and understand. But I'm I'm on their team, so that's why I say that. Um, I thought it was really a good mystery, and um, they had their red herrings and their wrong direction they were going as we expect but they were um solid to keep after it and one of the things that was really great to see as the story develops is to see Thelonious developing into a leader he might be neurodiverse and this means you know anybody can do things if they are given the chance and uh, he's going to be quite the guy as he grows up i know he's fictional but <laughs> I really thought this was a good choice for libraries to, to add to their collections. So. And I know Sa Sally, um, you do um, shows for us here in Encompass Live and at our conferences here in Nebraska on um, books for teens, books for um, children um, <clears throat> in our summer reading program group. And one thing you always say, I know, is, you know, these are the ages that this title has been, it says it's for them but your child, your children or, and teens in your library may read at different levels. You know, it's not a locked in thing. It, you know, it's gonna be a case by case basis. You may have some kids that read at a higher level than what might be recommended for this particular one, or other ones that might be at a lower level and you're just gonna do it case by case when recommending the books for kids. 
exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And next we have Tessa, right? Yeah. On Tessa me. here is our communications coordinator here at the Library Commission. Hi, guys. So I kind of came upon this book in a roundabout way. Um, I wasn't really looking for it to read. And memoirs usually aren't, they're the one nonfiction I will read, but not regularly. Um, so I actually saw some buzz about a tweet the author put out about um, when she was pregnant, somebody commented that her pregnant belly was a career killer. And that, um, I can't remember what else, but just talked about then she went on to say she was, you know, a successful writer for, I think she writes for the Jimmy Kimmel show, and then that she was writing the script for the movie for this book that she had written five weeks postpartum. So she was kind of um, clapping back to that comment that you can't have kids and be a successful author. But so I thought, okay, I want to read this person's book. She sounds kind of like a firecracker to me. And it was really good. It was worth the stepping out on a limb. It's this story about her relationship with her grandmother and a little bit about her grandmother's relationship with her mother. Um, she goes into their history, um, how her grandmother was raised and grew up and got married, her mother, and then this very close relationship she ended up having with her maternal grandmother, even to the point where she kept every single voicemail her grandmother ever left her. And there were a lot of them. So that's part of the book, just these verbatim voicemails from her grandmother. And um, her grandmother sounds like quite a character, very blunt and straightforward to the point where she's telling her things like, like you wore that dress to this wedding and it was a bad color for you or something, you know, like all these, these things. But it's a really touching memoir just to read all these conversations and how um, much these people care about each other. So I really enjoyed it for those reasons. And it wasn't what I was expecting. So that's always a nice twist as well. And I listened to this on audiobook and it's narrated by the author, which I always think kind of adds something a little bit special to, to audiobooks in general. But yeah, it was definitely worth it. It was a very quick read. Um, four hours on audiobook and um, yeah, would recommend. It's always nice to have a surprise when you'd be surprised by a title of a book when you, you were expecting something else and it turns out better, hopefully, <laughs> in the end. Yeah, I think um, because it's just a normal person's story. Like, there's nothing crazy that happens. There's no, like, non, or there's no, like, fiction, like, plot twist or element to the story where it makes it very unique. It's just very normal people's um, intricate relationships with each other. So, And probably makes so, it a lot more able for some people to identify with the story. That yeah, it's not definitely. Well, this, this crazy thing happened and we're going to write about it and make it this whole thing. It's like, no, it's just my life. Like yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So she's an excellent writer, um, and obviously that helps when telling your story to make it um, more readable and easy for people to pick up and understand. But I could see this as anybody's, you know, family story. Mm -hmm. I can see my grandmother and that grandmother the way you described it. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> All right. So next up is me. This is my other graphic novel. The well, I read many of them this year. These are the ones that I blogged about for us. Uh, Shadow of the Batgirl. I written by Sarah Kuhn and illustrated by Nicole Go. Um, this it was um, actually a surprise too, uh, depending on what you know about Batgirl. Um, this is probably not the Batgirl that you might know um, of. Um, you, if you're not as much into the genre, there have been many uh, Batgirls, uh, many um, women and girls who have worn the Batgirl costume and, and become her. And this particular story is about uh, Cassandra Kane, who is a, a 
a little more edgy Batgirl. She's, uh, there's previous, um, this is also a um, reimagining of an origin story of um, Cassandra Cain's origin story of how she became Bat, becomes Batgirl. Uh, there are previous no um, graphic novels and comics, lots of them about her. So if you want to read more about that, I highly recommend it. She is one of my favorite Batgirls. I mean, I do love the classics, but uh, she is just so edgy and not, taking crap from anybody type girl. <laughs> and she's a teen as well. Again, this is another uh, teen imprint. Um, and uh, this one is, it's, it's similar to her origin, original origin story, but um, not as dark. Uh, Cassandra Kane is a more, like I said, edgy, darker type um, character. Her history and her past is, is, not so happy um and th this Batgirl this version of Cassandra Cain also has that as well but it's a bit lighter in tone this one is so uh, maybe a little easier for some you don't want to set that dark dark um uh, in addition to to that sh this uh this story takes place um uh, mostly in actually Gotham Public Library yay libraries <laughs> so um I love Batgirl and I'm a librarian, so this was just like, well, they wrote this book for me. This is perfect. <laughs> so um, she ends up actually hiding out in the Gotham Public Library. Um, she has, um, this Cassandra Cain has been raised as an assassin um, uh, from a childhood uh, by a group of um, assassins that, you know, that's their job and she's been trained to be this and she knows nothing outside the world of her training this is all she's ever known as a, from a child she doesn't know anything about her past really just that she's been trained to be this this killer um and she is um supposed is on an, and one of her missions uh she is supposed to kill um a particular man and she doesn't she has an epiphany something kind of clicks in her head and says whoa what is what is going on here um this is this me is this should I be doing this? Um, and she doesn't do it. She does not kill the guy. So she has to run away and she can't go back to her assassins group because that will be a big problem. And she runs away from this, um, her former life. She wants to figure out who she is and who she wants to be. This is, she is a teen as well. So this is very typical of teens, I think in general, uh, trying to figure out who you are, who you're going to be. So in the, um, story of Cassandra Kane being an assassin and trying to remember what is her actual past. It's very similar to teenagers saying, who am I? What am I? Why am I doing the thing? In, should I keep doing the things they tell me to do? Should I just be myself? Who am, what is myself? Who am I? That kind of thing. So she runs away and um, she hides out in the Gotham Public Library. As I said, that's where she finds refuge. Um, and just she actually finds a little cubby up there to hide out in and nobody knows she's there. She she's she's an assassin. She can hide. That's her skill set, part of her skill set. And they don't know she's there for a long time that she's like kind of living in the library. And she starts reading the books in the library and learning about the rest of the world and like what things could be. Uh, she also meets a um, local restaurant owner um, who um, helps her and kind of becomes one of her mentors. And she meets the librarian at Gotham Public Library, Barbara Gordon. Name may be familiar to some of you. <laughs> uh, Barbara Gordon, the original classic Batgirl. Um, the, this Barbara Gordon is in a wheelchair. It is not explained how she ended up in that wheelchair in this particular story. Uh, but if you know um, the history of her, she, Barbara Gordon, Batgirl, does end up being put into a wheelchair and um, still goes on being her uh, detective self. Um, but something else is going on in Gotham as well. Batgirl has disappeared. Batgirl has disappeared and isn't, isn't doing any more um, crime fighting. And so what's happened? So she gets into this, you know, trying to solve the mystery of what's going on with Batgirl while trying to solve, solve her own mystery of what, who am I, where did I come from? Um, it's a great story. Um, it kind of leaves it open-ended that there hopefully will be more telling what happens after this um, to Cassandra Kane, um, this version of Cassandra Kane. I hopefully, I'm hoping there will be more. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Yeah. All right, pumpkin heads. All right. Um, this is another graphic novel. Um, it's by uh, Omaha author Rainbow Rowell, and it's illustrated by Faith Erin Hicks. And um, hey, <laughs> so I, you can see by the uh, cover art, uh, the illustrations are just beautiful, and they're in these gorgeous fall colors throughout the whole book. 
and I, I read this in September and it just put me in the mood for fall and fires and s'mores and um, I, I picked this because I was looking for something. I'm in a mentoring program and I mentor a teen girl and I was looking for something that she and I could read together. So I bought two copies of this and we read this. Um, it is set in the world's best pumpkin patch. And it's pretty obviously modeled after a pumpkin patch uh, near my house. Um, I, I live in Omaha and there is a well-known pumpkin patch in Gretna. And if you've been there, you will see the resemblance. So they've got um, maps of the, of, the, of the patch and it's pretty close to the one out here. So it's about two teens, uh, Josiah and Deja, and they are finishing up their last season of the pumpkin patch. They've worked in the succotash hut for several seasons and all fall they are just joined at the hip. The rest of the year they don't see each other. They only see each other here at the pumpkin patch. Um, so they call themselves fall friends. And then they have winter, spring and summer friends. But during the fall they are uh, together all the time. So it's Halloween night and it's their last night of the season. And after this, they're gonna go their separate ways, finish up their senior year of high school, go to college. They won't see each other. So um, Deja is determined that she is going to help uh, Josiah finally talk to his crush, the fudge shop girl. So she, rather than stay at the Succotash hut, they are going to go out. They are going to experience the pumpkin patch. They're going to try all the snacks and they're going to find this girl. And he is going to talk to her and declare his love for the fudge shop girl. He is, he's just been pining after her for years, but he's too shy. So they spend the whole night scheming to get these two together and turn this last shift into an adventure that they'll remember forever. So it's 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 great. It's a quick read because it's a graphic novel and it's also YA, but just gorgeous illustrations and it really put me in the mood for fall. Which right now we're going into the wrong season, but that's okay. <laughs> yes. I believe at the back of the book that um I, I remember reading that Rainbow Rowell had invited Faith to come to the pumpkin patch so that she could experience that particular pumpkin patch. To that know. sounds great. There's there's a picture of them together at the pumpkin patch. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. So she knew exactly how to draw it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, all the all the colors and and there's a goat that chases them around. I don't know if you can see this, but just beautiful illustrations. She's so talented. Another memoir. Okay, yep, this is a memoir. And I really love memoirs because oftentimes they give you insight into uh, the life of someone who's experienced things that are different than what you've experienced. But then also in the midst of that, sometimes you'll find real, uh, real, uh, you know, points of resonance that really you can relate to. And that was the case with this book. Um, it is by uh, Fook Tran. Uh, he describes himself on his website as an author, educator, classicist, and tattooist. He actually runs a tattoo shop with his wife. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, he was born in 1974 in Vietnam and his family fled the fall of Saigon in 1975 and they wound up being resettled in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And he describes them as the token refugee family. So he felt growing up like his family was always, always stood out wherever they went, they were being watched and observed um, because they were the one sort of different family in the community. Um, the book focuses basically on his childhood and adolescence up until he graduates from high school in 1991. So um, focused on a particular period of time. Um, and obviously his experience as a refugee, first generation American um, uh, and being Asian, uh, I guess Asian American um, is obviously something that I don't have that experience, um, but some of the points of uh, resonance is um, 
I'm probably 10 years older than him. So I went to high school in the early 80s and he went in the very late 80s, early, uh, he graduated in 91. But his description of high school just uh, was so familiar, especially his description of the cliques. He talks about, he was part of the um, punk skater clique and he talks about the rednecks that uh, they always uh, were antagonistic with and the the preps and the, you know, the jocks and his, his, um, he refers to it being very John Hughes-esque. And so, you know, it, it really reverberated with me. Um, and, and I thought of this, Krista, when you were talking about the library aspects of the Batgirl book, he got a job in high school as a library page. And so he talks a little bit about working in the library and the librarians. And so that, of course, uh, spoke to me. And then he's also, um, even though he's got this sort of tough exterior punker skater vibe, he's also developing this love of literature, which spoke to the English major in me. So, like I said, there were a lot of um, a lot of uh, experiences that, that he talked about that were different than mine, but a lot that I could relate to as well. Um, one of the things that he does really well, I think, is um, explore what it's like to be the child of immigrants. Um, and he talked about, you know, he, he doesn't really have a lot of, as a child, he doesn't have a lot of respect for his uh, parents or his father in particular is the one he has a fraught relationship with. And he does a really good job of showing, you know, the problems with their relationship and the problems with his father, but also the ways he is really harsh on his father when he probably shouldn't be. You know, he talks about when he's very young, he talks about his father every night, his father, who was a lawyer in Vietnam and he works at a tire factory in Carlisle. He comes home and he reads the newspaper at the kitchen table with the dictionary next to him and he looks up every single word he doesn't know. Um, and, you know, he talks about how difficult it is to look up things like net worth and you look up each word individually and put the two definitions together and it doesn't really, <laughs> that doesn't really capture what the the words mean together. I still um, like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, he talks about his dad with a tape recorder reading the newspaper out loud and trying to practice his pronunciation. So, you know, his dad is working really hard, but then he talks about how as a five or six year old, he was frustrated with his dad. For example, they were reading a Star Wars book together and he asks his dad, what's a Wookiee? And his dad's like, well, let's look it up in the dictionary. Well, they can't find Wookiee in the dictionary. And of course, he's sure the word is there and his dad is just, you know, failing at finding it. Neither of them realize it's a made up word. Um, another failure of his father, um, his parents read uh, the book 101 Dalmatians, the little golden book version of 101 Dalmatians to them all the time. And so his favorite character is the dog named, his dad always pronounces it colonel, because that's how it's spelled. And so at, at school then, this book comes up and he talks about colonel and all of the other kids laugh at him and so then he comes home and he confronts his father and says it's it's supposed to be pronounced colonel you know and his dad is really confused and looks it up and tries to decipher the pronunciation guide in the dictionary and you know so he's 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 pretty harsh on it hard on his dad um and you can see that his dad is really working hard and this was such a poignant quote. He said, I needed to trust my dad's ability to navigate the world at large, and I was already doubting him. Five-year-olds were supposed to believe what their parents said. Maybe some kids' parents still had the golden nimbus of infallibility, but not my parents and not for me. So I, you know, I've heard other uh, children of immigrants talk about that relationship with their parents and how, you know, the struggles their parents have to integrate into the culture colors their view of their parents, maybe sometimes unfairly. Um, so I thought that was really, he does a really good job of capturing that. Um, basically, the gist of the book is how he tries to fit in and find himself, again, that sort of young adult 
period of time when you're trying to figure out your place. You don't want to stand out in a bad way, but you also want to figure out who you are. And so he talks about how he's got sort of a, he's kind of got a, um, a trajectory, two-pronged attack, he says. One was aligning with the punk skater kids at school, and the other was academic success. And he kind of keeps these two parts of his life separate. But I thought he described really well why adolescents in particular are really cling to their cliques. He said, being a freak because of my weird clothes and hair was a respite. He's talking about, you know, the punk clothes and punk hair that he has. These were things that I had chosen. Fighting rednecks because you were a punk was far better than fighting because you were Asian. And fighting with allies was far better than fighting alone. So I thought that really captured why kids gravitate toward groups. Um, and then on the academic front, um, while he's working at the library book sale, he stumbles across this book called it's by Clifton Fadiman. It's called The Lifetime Reading Plan. You know, I think it first came out in 1960. And of course, it's full of the Western canon, you know, lots of white writers, American men, you know, sort of uh, uh, pretty, uh, like I said, classist. Um, but he takes this book home and he embraces it. And he's going to, you know, read all of these great writers. Um, and you know he now acknowledges that it was a pretty narrow view of literature, but it definitely gave him what he needed at the time, um, which he describes as kind of an entree into the world of big ideas that can connect people across time, space, and culture. Um, and so then the book ends, and he actually has uh, tried out, and he's been uh, awarded uh, the position of being a commencement speaker and he's getting ready to go off to college and he ends up getting accepted um, how he's going to pay for college is a real big challenge and so he has to get a scholarship and he does get accepted and he gets a scholarship to this college it's called a bard college and it describes itself and it's as in its admission literature as a place to think, which seemed like a really um, apropos college for him. So anyway, that was a great memoir. Sounds like And he's got an Instagram site where you can go and see all of his tattoo designs that he does, so. Nice, all right, I'll have to look for that. Uh, Sally? It was really fun when at the beginning you happened to use clap when you land to show the, the <laughs> alphabetically the, she comes up first. <laughs> this what um is about well it's told in free verse and it's in alternating uh, viewpoints but it's um two almost 17 year old girls who are daughters of a man who lives in New York with his wife and his daughter there. And then in the summer, he spends every summer in the Dominican Republic. The daughter in New York thinks he's there for business. The daughter in the Dominican Republic says, this is my best favorite time of year because father is here for the whole summer. Well, he dies in a plane, plane crash between New York and the Dominican Republic. And, and that's when they find out about each other and about the two families. The girl that in the Dominican Republic is living with her aunt because her mother has passed away. Um, her name is Camino, and the daughter in New York's name is Yahira, Yahira. And they both are going through this feeling of loss and also betrayal and anger and uh, so many emotions. And also even their futures are now in question to one degree or another because of the loss of their father. They do eventually connect with each other and um, have some conversations. And uh, one of the things that um, Camino is facing in the Dominican Republic is um, she had hoped to go to college. She doesn't think she's going to be able to. But the other thing that's happening is much more insidious she has always um, gone by herself to swim in this little cove not too far from her house. And this man starts showing up and she knows him but doesn't really know him and he's talking with her and she feels creeped out by him. Mm -hmm. And her father had always kept him at a distance. Now her father's not there. And she 
isn't bold enough to tell him to take a hike. So she tries to be, you know, devious, not be where he thinks she's going to be because he keeps telling her, you're going to be mine. I'm going to have you. Huh. And so I'm in this position of saying, stand up for yourself. You can do it. And somebody come in and rescue her. Oh, <laughs> the damsel in distress that Susan <laughs> mentioned before. Well, I didn't want that to happen either, but I didn't want her to end up being a victim of this man. Uh, things work out, not the victim of the man. I have to tell you that part. But it's it's such so well written. And again, it's, it's in free verse, but it's so well written. You feel the feelings that both of the girls are feeling, You're, their heartbreak and their anger and their guilt about being angry, but they have a good reason to. And also, you keep wondering about this title. Why Why is it named Clap When You Land? And I gave it all away in my um, description on the, the web page. The author explains that it is a Dominican custom to clap when the plane lands the passengers back in the Dominican Republic. Mm. So we um, should do that every time, no matter where we're landing. We, uh, we're all alive. <laughs> I think it's great that the planes land so often. <laughs> yeah. But this is such a heartfelt story, and it got a starred review in Kirkus, which isn't easy to do. And the final statement of the Kirkus review is a standing ovation. Wow. So anyone who knows how Kirkus can be pretty tough on books, to have that for your book is amazing. And this is a wonderful book. Definitely. Wow. And great our, cover design too. I just noticed the airplane cut out. I was gonna say I've been staring, you know, I put these slides together, I'm staring at this for a couple of days, and until you explained, I didn't see the planes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and our final title for today. Today, Tessa. <laughs> yeah, so this is Eleanor All Fan is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman. And it's been out for a little while now. I can't remember exactly. Let's see. It was written in 2017. So it's got a couple of years on it. And it's a um, mm -hmm. pretty popular book. I know this is a novel we have in our book club kits selection. So that's available through us. But I've read this several times, actually. And that's one of my themes of reading during the pandemic. I've read a lot, reread a lot of my favorite books just because mm -hmm. I think for the comfort aspect, I know what they're going to say to some extent. And so I don't, there's no um, like plot twist that I'm not going to be ready for or not be prepared for. So that's been a lot of my reading. And this one, especially, I love this book. I I don't even know how many times I've read it now, but the protagonist in it is so both lovable and hateful at the same time like it's amazing to me she's she's so completely flawed and not in the way you normally see female protagonists flawed she's not I think I wrote like she's not secretly gorgeous behind her glasses like <laughs> she's not lovingly clumsy she's just um incredibly flawed and both internally and externally so it's also a book about isolation, which I think is pretty uh, on the point for this year. But just um, she's self-isolated herself from everybody around her. Regard, there's no pandemic in the book. So, um, but yeah, so it's just about her like coming out of her isolation shell, making a friend, um, stepping out in the world a little bit, and. Uh, it's a really great read. It covers a lot of really hard things like mental illness, um, physical and verbal abuse, and suicide and uh, self-harm. So a lot of deep subjects in there, but it is also hilarious. I laugh every time I read it. So it has a little bit of everything in it, I think. All right, yeah, that's definitely a good thing. Rereading books that you've read before, I've I've done that over the years too. I didn't, not this past year, I haven't, but that is always a good comfort. Definitely, I think something where you know what's going to happen, you're not going to get surprised by some horrible, you know, twist <laughs> uh, that doesn't make it a good title. But um, 
Awesome. All right. So, and that's our final title for today. Now, that's not our final title of Friday Reads, but um, just a few that we picked out from the past year that we had, um, um, some of us here had blogged about. So thank you everybody for being with us here today. Thank you, uh, Susan and Amy and Tessa and Sally for joining me to talk about some of the books we've been reading. Um, let's see, I am going to slide this over here so you can see, you should be seeing that now. There we go. Um, we had talked about at the beginning about a couple of the um, pages, websites that we have for this. Um, the book reviews page, and this is these are all linked in our um, show description as well. Um, oh, and we got some comments coming in. I should, I should just, yes, um, anybody wants to share anything, any titles you've read or anything? Someone just says, thank you, this is great. I definitely added some books to my list. You're welcome. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you've got too many books to read. That's great. <laughs> um, I always end up doing that too, and that, uh, what Amy mentioned at the beginning, this is hopefully you know something to get people reading to um, discover new books maybe you hadn't before. Uh, and so hopefully, um, I always end up when, whenever I, somebody posts one of these on a Friday, I end up, I, I have I have bought some books based on someone's reviews in our Friday reads, yes, <laughs> and added them to my collection. Um, some of them I've read so far, and some of them I'm still on my to be <laughs> read list. Um, yeah, but yeah. You know, Huh? Krista, and um, as, as Tessa mentioned, that last focus in our book club kit collection, and we also, it's, it, it was pretty popular for a while, um, so we also put together a page of read-alikes, so if you find a book that you from us that you really want and can't get, but are in the mood for something similar, um, that's under the collections at NLC menu, there's a read-alikes page, I think it's all the way over to the... Oh, where is it at? It might be under book club kits. Yeah, up at the top, there's a read likes page. Ah. Click, yeah, click through that. Yep. And then I, I know uh, Eleanor Oliphant's right near the top of the list, and it will have other books that are similar. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you are looking to read some of these books, uh, some of them that we have reviewed are here, but are just, to, you know, yeah, um, promote our book club kits. Um, if you want to read something, we've got bot collections of these. You um, Multiple copies we'll send to you and then, um, yeah, go here to find other things. I don't know. There's a lot here. That's awesome. I know people are always looking for helping for, and this we could help some of you librarians too with your um, readers advisory yourself if you're not sure. Someone says, "I love this book. Now what?" And this is where you can get your book club kits. So this is the list um, of all of our Friday reads. We've also got them uh, broken out to fiction and nonfiction. And also on our blog, we've tagged them all Friday reads. So if you go to our blog and do a search, you'll also get just all of them um, with the most recent one. This is one from last Friday. Um, and you can see all of our blog posts here if you wanted to go that way to see what we've all um, read over the past since 2014 when we started doing this that's when it was <laughs> um and we had some more comments coming in thanks for the suggestions great titles yeah we we are you know i'm not sure how many of our staff are on this now at the commission is there 10 or 15 of us doing it now that sounds right somewhere around a dozen yeah have yeah so and i think like last year i did three because there's so many of us that are doing this so um not too not bad yeah yeah, get a good, good, you get a good variety of um, titles here because there are so many of us here and so many of the people with different um, uh, likes and different types of reading they do. And um, so it's going to run the gamut here. It's great. <laughs> so uh, there's a list of books that you can look for. Um, get you over here to our Encompass Live page. Yes. So on our Encompass Live page, as I said, we are recording today. So it will be here in our archives. Probably by the end of the day tomorrow, I should have everything ready and posted on here. Um, it'll be right here at the top of the list. The most recent ones will be here. We will have the um, 
The slides, you'll have a link to those if you want to use those and see those book uh, covers and links to both of our Friday Reads pages, the book reviews page and then the, um, where they are tagged in our blog will be on there as well. Um, everybody who attended today and re re um, registered for today's show, you get an email from me letting you know when the recording is ready. It'll be up here at the top of the page here. Uh, and while we're here, I'll show you this is our full show archives. If you want to look up for a particular topic, see if you've done a show on it, you can search for that here. We have, you can search the full archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want some just really current information. Um, that is because this is the full archives for Encompass Live, and I'm not going to scroll all the way down because there's a lot here. But going back to the beginning of our show, our show premiered in January 2009. So we have over 10 years worth of weekly shows here. Um, so if you do search the full archives, just pay attention to the original broadcast date. It's all on here. It's not right here. Uh, some of the information here will stand the test of time. Shows like this with book reviews, of course. Um, but some things may become outdated. There may be old information. Uh, services and products may have changed or even don't exist anymore. Links may be broken. Websites have moved. So um, just pay attention. If it's an older date, you might have some of that. You might have to you know, just be aware of as you are watching our archives. But we are librarians. We do archive things and keep things for historical purposes. And we will have our full show archives on here as long as we have somewhere to host it. Right now, we, host, um, all, we have a YouTube channel that the Library Commission does, and that's where all of our um, recordings are kept. So that'll wrap it up for today's show. Next week, our show is our Pretty Sweet Tech. Uh, every last Wednesday of every month is our Pretty Sweet Tech with Amanda Sweet, the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Library Commission. She always talks about something techie related. Uh, next week, how I turned my dad's house into a smart home. And she used Amazon Alexa. You could use other other products you use, but she's going to talk to you about how she did that for her dad. So please do sign up for that and keep an eye on our schedule here. I'm talking with um, a few people now about um, what our topics are going to be for April. So keep an eye on our schedule to see what will be coming up. Um, we also have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. I've got it linked and open over here. Um, if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like on um, Facebook. You'll get notifications. Here's a reminder to watch for today's show. Uh, speaker information, when our recordings are available, so we um, post things on there. We also post onto our various social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, not sure anywhere else, using the hashtag EncompLive, so you can always look for that hashtag out and about elsewhere. So that wraps up for today's show. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, um, all of you, for sharing your books uh, with us this morning all of our speakers today, and hopefully we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.